This is Lab Medicine Rounds, a curated podcast for physicians, laboratory professionals, and students. I'm your host, Justin Croder, the bowtie bandit of blood, a transfusion medicine pathologist at Mayo Clinic. And today we're rounding with Dr. Justin Juskowicz and Dr. Andrew Norgan, both assistant professors of laboratory medicine and pathology here at Mayo Clinic, to talk with us about informatics for the pathologist. They're both leaders in this field, and I'm grateful for both you guys joining us today. Good morning. Thanks for having us. All right, so let's uh, let's uh, kick off with kind of um, you know I think as pathologists uh, maybe we're used to calling the help desk at our institutions or sometimes uh, dealing with uh, IT for support on our projects. But uh, from your vantage point, why why should pathologists care about informatics in 2022? I think actually informatics has been in the core of pathology and lab medicine for a very, very long time. Uh, our field was the first to spearhead the use of information systems to collect data and to help facilitate laboratory testing and anatomic pathology consultations for decades now. And we've been able to use that technology up to this point to really help optimize the care we bring to patients and the workflows within our lab. And so informatics really in some respects in healthcare got its start in the, in the medical laboratory and has been able to empower us to be able to use that data, to use that information and the knowledge we glean from it to really transform clinical practice. So I, I would actually reframe the question slightly as to why should pathologists continue to care about informatics? Because we have been um, in large part thought leaders, especially during the early inception of this field. What do you think, Dr. Norgan? Yeah. I, I... I agree completely. And I just ex extend on that. If I think healthcare organizations have done a great job up to this point in, in sort of recording, cataloging, warehousing their information. And, and maybe we've been less successful at taking that information and creating value for the patient from, from that information and bringing that back into the practice. And if we look at, at Every other industry, uh, they're probably 10, maybe 20 years ahead of us in using information to do whatever it is they do better. And so I think as we look at informatics going forward now in time, and especially with artificial intelligence and machine learning coming to the fore, and with cloud technologies making it easier to bring information together, compute on that, find some value, and again, bring that back into your practice, it's a, it's a great time for pathologists to be digging in and understanding, well, how can I use this data and this information to improve whatever aspect of the practice I'm doing, be that anatomic pathology, clinical pathology, or, or something related to, to either of those. I really appreciate you guys <laughs> putting me on the right track. We're really continuing uh, our interest in informatics. Um, but you guys really are, uh, you know, informaticians, uh, if that's the right word, but, and, and I love picking your brain, but, you know, not all of us can be information experts like you, although we certainly uh, are um, using it in our practice. Uh, I was wondering if you could kind of share with our audience, what are some of the fundamentals that pathologists in, in practice, pathologists in training should be aware of and might be uh, thinking about? You know, fundamentally, I, I think it's critical for people to understand the systems that exist for managing and organizing the data. And so in a healthcare institution, at, at sort of a first approximation, that's the laboratory information system and the electronic health record. Those are the systems that are really going to allow communication of information to the clinicians. And so understanding how does information flow into these systems, how does information flow out of these systems, and, at, and again, at what point are there opportunities to do value-added work with this information to improve whatever it is we're doing as a pathologist, whether you're running a laboratory or, or very much, you know, doing case-based anatomic pathology work, there are opportunities to use that data to do that work better with higher quality and to bring, again, new technologies to the work that we're doing. So fundamentally understanding what are those data types, how do those systems talk to one another, um, how do those systems allow third-party systems to interface with them and add value, be that, again, middleware or other kinds of things that we, that we see deployed in our systems. I think that's a fundamental piece that, that people need to understand. I think the other piece, and I'll let maybe Dr. Jeskowicz talk about this a little bit more, is 
is understanding how to use that data to, to develop verifiable insights. So, you know, when we, when we look at publishing now, pretty much every paper has a statistical component to it. Um, every, every machine learning paper certainly has statistical aspects to it. And as we're looking to bring those technologies into our practice and they become part of, of what it means to quote unquote, do medicine or do pathology, I think it's critical that we have enough understanding of, of those technology systems, approaches and fields that we're able to adequately judge, you know, what is good work? Um, what is maybe not so good work? Where are the flaws? in the methodology of, of this study and, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, so what Dr. Norgan is talking about has been kind of the involvement of evidence-based medicine, I would say across most fields of medicine, if not all, over like the past decade or so. Uh, the next level up is not just the application of those, you know, those skills to now a new area of research, evaluating machine learning and artificial intelligence and stuff. But I think the next level up that will be for pathologists and particularly pathology trainees coming in is going to be data literacy. So it's knowing how your data is captured, in what form it is captured, and then based off of those forms, how do you do your, you know, as you're taking data out of your LIS or hopefully in some sort of replicated source from that, how do you evaluate the data critically that you're getting out, find any errors or missing or missing data elements, up, use the appropriate technique to fill those in, and then be able to take that data to start generating insights. And it may be the most simple statistical comparison to begin with and evolving that way upward towards machine learning. But to be perfectly honest, for, for many of us operationally in the, in the lab or in the anatomic pathology space, being able just to be able to access our data, manipulate it and present it in ways that it can inform even operational things in real time in our labs can be, have been and continue to be huge value add gains for the laboratory and our patients. That's interesting. I, as I hear you guys explaining uh, these fundamentals I, in my head, I, I'm really almost constructing a map of like, you know, the system, you know, and the flows, you know, um, <laughs> there's rivers or something flowing through there. Uh, but um, that's really an interesting way uh, to really also highlight, you know, understanding the, the system that we work in and how it can affect change. Is this kind of the same strategy you guys take when you, I know you guys are teaching our uh, re, in our pathology residency program, teaching uh, informatics. Is this kind of the, the same approach you take there or is there a different approach and why, why might you go that way? So we, we sort of have two approaches that, that we've, we've gone down. One is a didactic approach where we cover um, a kind of a core curriculum that's been developed by CAP and by uh, the Association uh, for Pathology Informatics. It's known as the Pathology Informatics for, uh, for Residents or Pathology Informatics Essentials for Residents. Mm -hmm. And that curriculum lays down really, again, kind of getting to your earlier question, the baseline level of knowledge that would be expected of a pathology resident in, in, the, in sort of the realm of informatics. So everything that, that Justin and I have been talking about in terms of data literacy, systems, how systems talk to one another, the standards that are used in the industry to facilitate that communication, et cetera, and so on. So we, we have a didactic curriculum built around that. And then we have a, a, a sort of application-based curriculum where we try to get people to actually dig in and work with the data and, and perform some of these functions. Again, not to become computer programmers per se or anything else, but to have sort of that experiential learning of, of encountering data-based problems and then strategies for solving those problems in order to accomplish the kinds of tasks Justin was talking about earlier, be it an analytic task or putting a system into place that's going to take data in and then put out some sort of altered data to facilitate a laboratory function and so on. We expect, uh, you know, a, a pathologist or laboratorian, you'll be sort of in charge of making these things happen, but you probably won't be doing all of them yourself. And so the facility we're hoping people walk away with is to know what's possible. Mm -hmm. So what can be done? What are the likely issues that are gonna be encountered in, in pursuing that? What are possible solutions to those issues so that they can guide their team in, in sort of 
figuring out the problem, solving the problem, and, and finally implementing that solution. And circling back around, I think the sweet part or the sweet spot for pathologists is that we, as part of our training and then part of our laboratory directorship roles, we have a whole lot of experience in the validation and evaluation of new laboratory tests or new offerings. And these informatics tools, whether they're software applications or just simple data visualizations that help these workflows, can be the same methodologies and the same way of talking and evaluating them really do run and are pretty much the same. And so as part of our training and our role already, we already have a leg up on being able to evaluate these and assess their impact, good or bad, on our workflows and our patient care. So pathologists already, already have the mindset and the training to be able to begin to take these offerings and do the critical evaluation and being the leaders of those groups within their labs that Dr. Norgan talked about. Mm -hmm. And how do you guys recommend um, that, uh, that pathologists reach out to informatics experts for collaboration? Like you said, you know, uh, having a general understanding and mm -hmm. uh, what's possible is, is uh, healthy and important. But, um, you know, how, how do we interact with the informatics group? Uh, like you would any other subspecialty expert you've got in your large laboratory. Uh, I'm particularly partial to tea. So a free tea for me will get you about 30 minutes of good conversation. Um, and he's laughing because for him it's coffee. Uh, but to be honest, just like the, the, I, I don't think there is any magic formula. It's a phone call, it's running into a colleague in the hallway, it's an email. But coming to that conversation with a crystallized idea of what your your need or your your um, your desired you know product or functionality is and some idea where that data resides is actually a really good starting place to start those conversations because then it makes it easier for individuals with an informatics background to start scoping in their head exactly how big of an ask it is and what sort of data infrastructure is already in place that on which that offering may be built. But to be honest, for most of the time when I need some help from the, um, the informatics crew here at our own institution, it starts with a page, it starts with a phone call, it starts with an email, and usually an offer to buy them coffee. Right, Dr. Norgan? Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's, it's just like engaging any other expert that you would to, to help solve a, a clinical or procedural problem in your laboratory or, or, or again, anatomic pathology um, area. I think, you know, bre breaking it out more generally, it's going to be very different depending on the kind of institution you're at, the size of that institution, and how developed that institution's current approach is towards information management and informatics. But every institution is going to have a CMIO. Many institutions will have an associate CMIO for laboratory medicine and pathology or someone, you know, over the lab's areas. And that that's a, an individual you should be able to engage with and start to talk about the issues that you're facing in your laboratory or in your practice and how the systems at your institution might be able to, to address those. Most departments and divisions will have that person or that group of people who are sort of the informatics folks. In DLMP here, we have a vice chair of informatics who, who, who has kind of a scope over the LIS and the interchange between the LIS and the EHR who'd be, again, a, a wonderful person to address with those kinds of issues and questions. And then, then new in, in our department, we actually have a division of computational pathology and AI. So a whole group of individuals now who are, are really dedicated to that and who would be resources at, at our institution that, that you could reach out to. And I think other institutions are doing similar things. Uh, um, so be it someone in your division, department, or uh, at the associate or actual CMIO level, there's someone at your institution who cares about data and using that data to solve clinical problems, and, and you should be able to reach out to them. Uh, that's really helpful. I appreciate both your advices on this about, uh, you know, uh, having an idea of what your issue is and what you want, where some data is, and also how you might reach out to. And, and the acronym CMIO is that Chief Medical Informatics Officer? Chief Medical Information Officer, I think, is, is usually. And it's, it, you know, they sit next to that CIO who's more of a, of a technical person or an IT person and often bring in that sort of medical 
um, aspect to them. Frequently, the CMIO is going to be an informatics trained physician. I see. So I'm on team coffee. That's who I'm buying coffee for, it sounds <laughs> like. <laughs> so we've been talking about a couple of different things. I, I was curious, uh, for those of us like myself, who you know, I remember doing my informatics uh, rotation in my residency program, I think it was maybe 14 or 15 years ago. I'm sure I'm quite outdated at this point in time. I was curious, are there any uh, informatics resources that you guys recommend that those of us could kind of brush up on our, you know, you, we've been talking about systems. Uh, we, you were using the acronym LIS for laboratory informatics systems, uh, EHR for electronic health record, but then also you, we've been talking about uh, data literacy. Are there any, um, you know, resources you guys recommend? So if you'd asked us what, 10 to 15 years ago, the, the list would have been really, really short um, because informatics as a field has been um, just like all of these new divisions are spinning out and now we have fellowships and now this is a, a medical subspecialty. Those resources have been expanding more and more. So on the pathology side, the American Society for Clinical Pathology has some online offerings and they also have some textbooks that they now um, offer for sale, either electronic or print. Um, um, so there are some resources there. The American Medical Informatics Association, Association AMIA, also is, has been really busy spinning up a whole lot of educational offerings beyond just the laboratory, but in broad, the broader medical practice as well. Um, and then the... Um, as uh, Dr. Norgan mentioned, the Association for Pathology Informatics now has an annual conference, and part of that conference is a lot of workshops. And then depending on how deep you want to go into the weeds as far as data science and how much do you want to actually start learning how to manipulate data on your own, a lot of the um, different programming languages and stuff now have conferences and workshops that they um, that they offer um, and the online resources um, just for reading to be able to start learning how to to do some of that data literacy and manipulating data and stuff and making visualizations that uh, those offerings available online have exploded over the last decade or so I would say Dr. Norgan yeah I agree completely with all of the suggestions um, I think if you want a sort of healthcare and pathology specific look at informatics. The, the University of Pathology Informatics by ASCP is, is a great resource and, and it offers, I think, over 20 different um, lectures or, or, or sort of blocks of curriculum that cover really the, a, a large spectrum of informatics. So you can pick and choose. I think there is some cost associated with that, or, or at least it might be governed by your institution's subscription to, to ASCP resources, but, but there are certainly pieces in there that I think are, are valuable and would round out someone's um, informatics education. The online resources have exploded in, in the last probably five years, especially. They're not always specific to pathology, but I think that's okay. A lot of the problems are really generalized, generalizable problems. And so um, for free, you can get an education in data science, data literacy, in, in one of the popular open source programming languages, Python or R, and you can do that all at your own pace, um, online with no cost at all on, on any computer. So it, I, I would say it's incredibly accessible if you want to learn about some of these things, if you want to go further and actually develop real expertise in one of these areas, maybe an area related again to your work, say you're in molecular pathology and you want to learn bioinformatics more deeply, or your your statistical background isn't what you wish it was, and you want to you want to beef up on that, or you want to learn about AI and machine learning, um, there are online sort of learning platforms that now have what I would argue, I mean, the curriculum is coming from MIT and Harvard and Stanford. It's really, you're getting, I think, a top tier education. And th those would be platforms like edX or Coursera. Um, there's often a free option associated if you don't need credit and don't need to, to sort of be able to take that and use it for something downstream. You can, you can subscribe to these courses and go through them at your own pace without cost, or, or I think there's a minimal cost associated with some of them. So um, really great opportunities to, to go out and get an education in an area of informatics that interests you and that is relevant to, to the kind of work that you do. 
That's phenomenal. So we're going to, for our listeners, we're going to put a number of those recommendations in the show notes. And uh, we've been rounding with Dr. Juskowicz and Dr. Norgan. Thank you both for taking the time uh, to talk with our listeners today and, and help us to continue our, our interest in informatics. Pleasure. Thanks very much. So to all of our listeners, thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions via email. Please direct any suggestions to mcleducation at mayo.edu and reference this podcast. If you've enjoyed Lab Medicine Rounds podcast, please subscribe. Until our next rounds together, we encourage you to continue to connect lab medicine and the clinical practice through insightful conversations. Mm -hmm.